My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello, and thank you for joining me on another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Devin Marty, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Devin is the strategic development manager at WiseSoft, a very interesting company doing interesting work, and the author of The Decision-Making Employee. Devin and I have spoken once or twice before, and to me, Devin is a cool cat, very interesting young dude, so I really wanted to interview him from my podcast here. Devin, thank you for taking some time to talk to me. Hope you're doing well in Denver. Let's Thank you very much, David. Absolutely. Let's jump into this. Can you tell me how your experience in blockchain and decentralized finance began and where those two intersect? Because I have ideas, but I'm not sure if I'm on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. My foray into this uh, deep, deep dive that is blockchain and, well, decentralized finance and uh, where I work now. I, it all started back at um, in university, at the University of Rochester. Um, I had done optical engineering for two years, realized, hey, I don't want to be stuck in a lab for the rest of my life just on some you know accident. I get this great paying job or whatever. And, and so I was like, all right, time to time to do what I actually think I, I want to do. Um, and that switched my minor, which was a, a business and economics minor, to a major and uh, pursue that. And so one of the courses uh, that was uh, required as a business uh, major at the University of Rochester uh, was a class that was originally was not supposed to be on the topic of decentralization, but it ended up that the professor usually teaches it just didn't happen, you know, one of those coincidence uh, or, or uh, moments of, oh, how did this happen? Did this happen for a reason? But uh, it was a professor from the the Simon School of Business, which is the University of Rochester's graduate school, uh, okay. graduate business school. And his name is Ron Schmidt, a wonderful man, um, pretty scary at first, not going to lie. Um, <laughs> and he came in and just introduced me to this topic of decentralization in business. Um, what that means, there's, there's a lot there and I'm sure we'll get into it, but that was the, uh, the first spark of, of interest. And from then on, it was, um, just a series of events that led me down to, you know, cryptocurrencies and blockchain and actually getting, you know, starting working at a company as a strategic development manager, uh, you know, talking about these products uh, and services on a daily basis, starting my own podcast you know, really getting down into the weeds with some of these people uh, who are just deep, deep down developers. Um, it's what an interesting field. And I think it's going to change everything we do. Yeah, I'm really interesting in hearing your thoughts on it, because from my perspective, as somebody who worked for marketing agencies for like 20 years and somehow survived it, probably by the skin of my teeth, I'm interested in whether or not or how these two parts or, or practices, I should say, can fit together to somehow make working in general terms more efficient. So mm -hmm. let yeah. me try to stick to my list so I don't ramble too much with this. Mm -hmm. So how did your interest in your interests in finance and blockchain, first of all, relate to your podcast? 
Yeah. Oh, so um, uh, there's a podcast I run called Specific Knowledge. It's a little of an homage to uh, Friedrich Hayek, who, while not considered this widely, I would consider the the father of decentralization. Um, and I I do this with uh, two other guys who are in the industry in in our community. And um, so the topics of of blockchain and decentralization really uh, are, are essentially the main focus of okay. the podcast. Um, are you talking about you? So you want this podcast specifically, or the podcast I run? Just well, I wanted to, I wanted to know about the podcasts that you're involved yes. with. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Yeah, and, um, yeah. That podcast again, specific knowledge, homage to Friedrich Hayek, who. Uh, that there's this economic component of decentralization as you know academic you can really understand how the the feedback loops operate and uh, the the market structures and then tying that into blockchain uh, Friedrich Hayek actually there's a quote uh, I think it was in 84 uh, he's doing this interview and literally the line is like we need to find some way to create a, a source of finance or money that is not in the hands of government. We need to take it out of the hands of the government, but in a way that's nonviolent. And that's until we do right. that, yes, yeah. So um, a very uh, you know free market mentality, libertarian mentality, but also like it's it's a very Austrian economic, uh, well, very specific to Friedrich Hayek mentality of let's uh, let's create this thing. But back in 84, you know, what? No, the internet wasn't even a, really a thing no, uh, not that people 84. could access. No, no I didn't even know if it was around yeah. in 84. I mean, I started in web design like yeah. in the mid 90s. And it was had, um, Air Force like, or military and academic use of, of the internet, but not till um, Berners-Lee in I think 90 or 91. Yeah, very, uh, that's very... when it became... Yeah, Correct. very basic. I mean, back in the 90s, Yahoo was the shizzle, Excite, mm, yeah. Dogpile. Uh, we, I think we used page kits to make websites. It was all HTML. You sit there all day long like this, and you're looking at code. That's it. That was the only way to do it. And so now we have drag and drop. Um, so let's break this down in layman terms decentralization yep. financial decentralization wtf <laughs> in layman terms yes so decentralization um then is, you can get into practice yes yeah decentralization is think centralization think hierarchy think putting everything in one place it's okay. just the ability to take everything that's in that one place disperse it say around the world or around a country or around a, an office uh, and have all of those uh, things that were in the same place that were working on the same function or whatever it is now they're dispersed and there's some network that supports them all making that decision together the mm. key there's a lot of strength there because you can't attack the one place now say if it's a bank well, you can rob a bank, but if you have a decentralized network, like if you get into blockchain, and we'll talk about applications there in okay. a soon, yeah, you can't rob the blockchain because there's no central place of point of attack, uh, and that's security is one of the biggest um, factors or, or uh, benefits of decentralizing something. But there are, I think, I I truly believe far more uh, benefits than just that so okay so for for people watching or listening decentraliz mm -hmm. decentralization is it fair to compare it to something like tor oh exactly yeah That's so so let's say for and 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 i hope everybody watching or listening is familiar with tor it's great that you basically have a way to get to get online with a modern web browser, but it's anonymous because A, there's multiple layers of encryption, but also you have distributed servers, mm -hmm. if I'm explaining it correctly, where you have different people, different servers all over the world that are encrypting these, these messages or signals going through it. So if one goes down, 
it, it, exactly. it, it can't be hacked. I, I know I'm not explaining it no, uh, I think that's, that's very well. Explained. Yeah, it's think about that tor, you know, BitTorrent or whatever it is. These are places that are, uh, uh, or this is a a unified decentralized network that is pro usually used for illegal activity, downloading movies that are pirated or, or whatever. Uh, in some cases, there, there's obviously more, but there needs to be, and I'm, I'm not supporting this, but for their purpose, there needs to be security against getting shut down from a government, right? Well, sure. If you're familiar with, um, and I don't even know if this guy's still alive or not, but I'm fascinated by the story of uh, Kim.com. Are you familiar with him? Kim. Kim dot, dot, no, no, you no. get this guy is fascinating, yeah. fascinating. He created Mega Upload. Okay. Which was Dropbox, basically, but with no and, and if and if anybody's listening to this and you're offended or something, I apologize because I, I didn't live this guy's life. I think he's probably ingenious um, and, and very, very clever and everything else. I'd love to learn more, but Dropbox, but basically no rules. Mm -hmm. So you can upload whatever you want. You can share whatever you want. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, his role was I'm just the one backing this financially. I'm not doing anything. Um, but yeah, some, somehow or other, legally, they were able to bring him down. Sure, so I'm yeah. pretty sure he's serving time somewhere, but I don't know where exactly. But I remember seeing a documentary on him and thinking, I would love to talk to this guy just to pick his brain. It's fascinating. So if we have something like Dropbox mm -hmm. that you can upload anything you want, and share anything you want. Yep. How does that affect decentralization? Well, I do you mean affect in a good way? But I think. Yeah, I'm just to yeah, better I'm understand just, decentralization. Yeah. So yeah, that's a. I think let's compare it to a centralized version. So you have Dropbox. Let's just use. Yeah. And let's use a real world uh, use case that's not you know has someone in in jail right now. Um, Filecoin. Uh, okay. And again, none of this financial advice and all educational. Um, not promoting Filecoin. I'm just gonna talk about them. Uh, so same with Dropbox. <laughs> so exactly. Dropbox, yeah, is yeah centralized. You have a problem, call up Dropbox. No problem. They'll likely fix it for you. Uh, there's a service they they charge. Um, you need to pay that, or else you can't access their service. Um, and there's certain, you know, one gigabyte, two gigabyte. You can pay for the amount of gigabytes of storage you want. Sure. Okay. With Filecoin uh, or other cloud storage um, services built on blockchain, there, you know, likely with Filecoin, there is a support team. But, and I don't know too much about Filecoin specifics. I don't know how decentralized they are. There is a spectrum. But let's say they're fully decentralized. Their team would likely just be there to, you know, educate or support, like here, click these buttons, but they couldn't change anything for you because it's open source. And what that would mean also is it's probably built into the protocol uh, where if you want to upload onto Filecoin's cloud storage services, first of all, where's the cloud storage come from? This is all supported by the network, similar to, and I'm sure we'll get into it, like Bitcoin is uh, a series of routers all over the world that people are creating to with the incentive of getting more Bitcoin. So similar to Filecoin, different consensus mechanism which means that they have computers running different things and they get probably get Filecoin as a reward as well for keeping cloud storages or, or their computers running for cloud storage for other people, but in an encrypted way where they couldn't tap into it because it's not all just stored on their one, their one computer, right? There's maybe, if I upload a photo on Filecoin, one, one of the ones and zeros goes to that guy's computer and the other goes to that guy's computer and that guy's that guy's computer and it's all over the world. Right. And so... Yeah, go ahead. I mean, similar, I mean, for, for in, in, in layman terms, for the business owner, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. or whoever listening, it would be like Amazon. I mean, that's the easiest, sure. simplest sure. yeah. concept you could conceive. I mean, if you're, and, I, and I'm not suggesting someone go do it, but if you're capable of hacking Amazon, it wouldn't really matter because they're decentralized. They've got servers all over the world that's how i'm able to go to amazon prime on my roku mm -hmm. and joe blow in mexico is able to do the same thing on his roku or what have you so 
that's an accurate comparison. Uh, yeah, I would say Amazon is definitely nowhere near as decentralized as in these other, right? right? Because they have to build these facilities and you can go and attack the facility. You know where they are. You know, right. right, but to understand yeah, the concept. Sure, yeah, the Amazon Web Service and how that works, um, absolutely. So are there ways that decentralization or decentralized finance, or for that matter, blockchain, mm -hmm. is are, are there ways that this would work for the typical mom and pop? Yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, let's just start. I mean, what's something you're interested in? We'll, we'll go off of that. What's, what's a hobby of yours that you do on a daily basis? Uh, maybe not even a hobby, just a necessity. Um, let's say, I mean, a local optician because I wear glasses. It's just the first thing that I think of off sure. the top of my head. Yeah. So let's go with supply chain there. Um, if that, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, just, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's blockchain is a distributed an open and distributed ledger, which just think of a ledger as literally that, like a, a you write on a ledger of you owe me this and I owe you this, right? So it's open. Anyone can see it. It's auditable. It's decentralized. As we talked about, it's spread all over the world. So no one can change it and have no one else see that it's changed, right? No one has control over it. And then the third thing, it's very good at what a ledger does, which is storing information. So those three things, it's, it's uh, immutable. It stores information extremely well. And then it's auditable by anyone. So those are the three components that make up a distributed ledger. We take that to supply chain. Well, that's perfect. We need to know when things are where, who's moving them, what trucks are driving them, how much is on the truck. Uh, it's good to know that it can't be changed because for me as the business owner, I need to know that that stuff is actually on there and the, the truck uh, driver is not stealing some of my glasses, right? Right. And then the, the third thing is that get anyone in my company can see that. And also you, the consumer, can see that as well. So you can see. Well, yeah, okay. They they said the glasses were stolen, and I'm gonna go look at the ledger, and oh, yep, it looks like that didn't the math doesn't add up. So yes, it makes sense, right? So the business has to be able to have enough quantity or enough size and scale to make it relevant to them. I mean, if you don't have shipments coming in and going out that you need to track. Sure. No. Yeah. And, and it definitely is. That's just the use case. I but I get what you're saying that yes. you could apply the principles of it. Exactly. So if I take the example of the optician and say they need a way to process their bookkeeping, they can move the bookkeeping to the cloud rather than in their physical store with old fashioned mm -hmm paper ledgers, they need a way to automate their billing and receipt process. They need, so in a, if, if I'm following you correctly, by doing these things, which to some extent you could say is digital transformation, you're, sure. you're implementing decentralization. Yeah. And I would say okay. you do obviously uh, with, with their, fee or payment structure oh easy right that's a that's a whole component of cryptocurrency that okay. instant cash or instant transactions and then yeah an internal understanding of where things are uh, located or what patients have what uh, say hey say you're abroad and um, you lose your glasses and you need to go get uh, some a new pair it's you know, it's hard for me to get my prescription in America let alone some other country are they going to wire that to no probably not but if they can if your doctor has that information and they can prove on blockchain that they're a medical, you know, well, we would call them a note, but a, a medical expert, right. they can then over there, uh, wherever you say you're in England, in England, you're that doctor that you went to over there can say, hey, I'm also a doctor, send me that information. But guess what? They don't need to send you all the information. They can send just the pertinent amount. So it's not like some HIPAA violation and you can get your glasses and be on your way. Right. So it's. And so in blockchain would also assist with security Absolutely. because there yes. would be multiple levels of, I don't want to say penetration, but I can't think of a better word. Yeah. M multiple levels of security. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. How would you describe cryptocurrency in theory? And then secondly, in practice to a small business owner or entrepreneur wondering about its viability? 
Yeah, and um, I know we spoke about this a little right before. Your, your, you yourself, and sorry if that's um, uh, too too personal. That you're not at all, well. not at okay. all. Okay, okay. So yes, uh, too not even a skeptic. But no, not at all. Who, but yeah, to yes, cl- yeah. to clarify, yes. I'm a little bit skeptical of Bitcoin. I'm not skeptical that you know I don't think you're sincere by any means. Mm-hmm. But yeah. as far as for me, Bitcoin what gives me some degree of skepticism are really two factors. One, where you have someone like an Elon Musk who can get online, smoke mm-hmm. a joint on some Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, Rogan whatever. <laughs> but if he could smoke a joint on a program and say that Bitcoin is pure there, whatever he said, it wasn't particularly mm-hmm. beneficial. And then it tanks the next day. That to me is not sufficiently regulated or stable. And then the the other thing for me is the volatility just in general Mm -hmm. terms where it's up and down, up and down. So those are my concerns. So I'd love to hear your take on it. And you're more informed on Bitcoin than I am because you're more active in it than I am. I would look yeah. at it as an investor. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, of course. So you see it as more of a stock than currently, than um, maybe anything else. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay, I'm just, yeah, okay. So yeah, I would say, first of all, to to the volatility point, I think, um, well, well, I know uh, any juvenile or, or young market is, is going to be volatile, of course. Uh, the more and more, as the pie gets bigger, of course, it gets less volatile because there's more volume. Secondly, I think the stock market would be pretty volatile if it didn't open and close every day um, as Bitcoin is open 24-7. So there's also that factor. Uh, and the third factor that is probably the biggest and most pertinent is the the Bitcoin price specifically um, and for, for how it's, and we can get into this, it's consensus mechanism and, and that's how it's proof of work is what we call it, uh, which means that computers have to run to support it which is you know the the environmental impact discussion and and, and all this so but we can get into that uh, in a second all i'm saying is though it lends itself to uh manipulation of people who are just in on the beginning or have a lot of money right now and can just come in buy up a bunch because the liquidity um which is you know liquidity is real value or or like um if you have ten dollars or a hundred dollars in the bank but there's the bank only has ten dollars because it's a fractional reserve bank you can only take $10 out of the bank. Like if there's a run on the bank, you only get $10. So liquidity is very important. And if you put a lot of money in or take a lot of money out when there's small amounts of liquidity, that dramatically affects the price. And so you have to consider that a lot of these exchanges, I think all of the exchanges together have 16% liquidity or something like that for Bitcoin. Mm. Because most of it's stored offline in cold storage wallets or or often non-custodial wallets that aren't on an exchange that can be switched for US dollar. And to be honest with you, so far, almost everything you're describing so far, to me, in my view, mm -hmm. you could say the same thing is true for the NASDAQ. Uh, I would say it's especially true for the NASDAQ. Yeah. Um, And then, yes. Okay. So let's, let's pivot back to your question. What would I say to a small business owner, you, I think, or or an entrepreneur, also also you. So what will I say to you? Um, Not to convince you, but maybe to to tell you a little bit more and and maybe pique your interest. Uh, and say that it's it's a little bit more than just the next hot Tesla stock is what I'm trying to say. It's um, in a way, in a, in a grand you know macro view, um, is access to financial freedom for everyone on Earth um, because it is the first time we have had a money, a currency, a means of exchange that is not controlled or not printed. I should say the supply is not controlled by any entity ever. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you could say it's controlled by the owner, but guess what? The owner made it and it's out there and the owner can't change it now. So Mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I was I was actually listening to you thinking about everything that you said. So of the the, uh, and and another Mm -hmm. issue that I see is with Bitcoin, the fact that Mm -hmm. a there are many, many different types or or but also of vendors but also the other issue that i watch is how far can 
regulation go in terms of really attempting to put structure and stricture confines to Bitcoin? In other words, it could then, it seems to me that Bitcoin and decentralized finance itself is really kind of um, contrapuntally opposed to the type of monetary system we currently have. So that maybe mm -hmm. that uh, st structure, if you will, I don't want to call it big brother because it's really not, sure. but I don't, it, it seems that that system isn't going to knowingly let this other newer system come in and take over. How do you? Of, yeah, a lot to unpack here. Okay. Um, I'd offer you some tea if I could, but uh, I can't reach <laughs> through the screen. I I'd, offer. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there is a lot to unpack there. I think let's, let's just stay on the, the regulation train. So you're right. Yes. Okay. This is a, uh, a, a finance, a financial tool, uh, currency means of exchange is not controlled by anyone. Okay. Whoa, whoa. The, this, the powers that be, we need to control this, you know, uh, but how I think about it just to start is think about it like Prometheus with, with fire, right? Prometheus gives fire to, to a human. Whoa, this is something that the, the elders like said that we need to pay taxes for. And, 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 uh, they had it in their, their one house and they funneled it to everyone's houses, everyone's house for heating. And, and, uh, that's the only way we've known fire and it, and it has to be, you know, like that. But now I have it. Like I know how to create it. Prometheus taught me. So I go back and I tell everyone in the village and people are like, Oh, whoa, I, either. Whoa. I don't trust you. Cause dude, then no, uh, you, how do you have it for free? That's too good to be true. Uh, there, mm. There's that. But at the same time, like, okay, so we, one, we think that because that's just the system we're in, right? A Nirvana fallacy where we should probably criticize the system we're in too, before we criticize others. But then at the same time, you know, we, we now have, these people are cold. I see that. I want to give them this fire to, to heat up their houses. Um, and, and so one, they won't let me. And two, obviously the regulators, the people who have the control are not going to let me. So what's the middle ground? Maybe they say, okay, yeah, you can give out this technology, but hey, 10% of the education of the cl classes have to go to us or whatever. So there's always going to be some kind of um, regulatory interest in, again, regulating because what what's that about? Okay, it comes back to decentralization versus centralization. The people in the hierarchy, the the points of centralization, the points that be the, the, the status quo want to maintain their power, like plain and simple, right? Mm -hmm. If they, what Bitcoin is, is it, it challenges that, right? Because we now can see that ecosystems and, and I'm not going to say Bitcoin specifically, uh, there, are, I think there are other options that are perhaps better and, and more uh, viable, but we can see that the system of blockchain based finance is more fair, uh, easier to access for everyone, n not manipulable, like what the the <laughs> Fed printing how many billions of dollars uh, every month? I have you no have idea, that. but well, yeah, and, yeah, and, and what is the liquidity of their assets mm -hmm. backing that up? I don't know. Has there ever been an I, audit of the Fed? Of, well, there is no asset back. It's it's fiat currency. It's it's based on belief. And if you want to say it's backed by anything, it's backed by the Pentagon, right? There's no gold standard, not since 1971. Uh, we went off that. And even that was a broken system of the Bretton Woods Agreement. So it's the, and the pure, I should say, the pure gold standard uh, uh, before uh, that went away under FDR or no, the other, the other Roosevelt. Um, so you had this pure standard, yeah, of gold backed dollars, which made sense. But after the Great Depression, it made no more sense anymore because people didn't want to go into deflationary periods where they would, it would be extremely hard on their citizens, right? So they just kind of outright banned the gold back, or not banned, but got rid of it. Yeah. And, and to an extent banned it, yeah, because they uh, didn't allow transfers from gold to dollar anymore. So um, it was gold was the reserve currency of the world, became the US dollar, became, you know, what is it going to be soon? Uh, either the yuan, the digital yuan uh, of China or... Hey, may, maybe it is Bitcoin. Uh, you have El Salvador adopting it as their um, their nation's currency 
what two weeks ago yeah so, I, I remember reading that yeah. is that the um i don't remember if they're the one who just had the new president sworn in like uh, there's a latin american country had a really young cool looking uh, young guys like in his 20s or something and he's saying basically he was coming in as an authoritarian leader oh, okay. but and I, and I don't know if I even have the right country but let me get get you back on track here yeah of course <laughs> sorry for digressing no no worries that's perfect i love the tangent okay so cryptocurrency has a future it's gaining stability mm -hmm. through increased usage definitely that um and you have to remember that there are a few things that we can do i see cryptocurrency as an upgrade to the capital system we live in that makes it definitely more of a synergy between you could if you want to put it plainly or basically uh like a social and a, and a capital society um or a communist and capital society again i wouldn't go that far and say use those actual terms but if we're saying it on a base level the 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 tone of those two is is what i mean uh what i mean more specifically though is that it does upgrade uh, our capital structure to currently you can't incentivize people to uh, give to the future or future generations for benefit currently, right? It's just not how anything's built. Um, but with coded money, which cryptocurrency is, you can now incentivize people. And this alone, I think, is if this were the one use case of cryptocurrency and, and that's it, I'd, I'd be extremely interested in this technology of Hey, let's help future generations in some way uh, and get profits right now for it. Like that's that sounds incredible, and there are ways to do that, right? So it's the first time it is an upgrade to um, a capital structure that is more ethical, that is fair, more fair, and that um, brings everyone into the fold and not just a few players at the top or at the Nasdaq or some bankers who probably own probably every company you could own or uh, sorry, every company you could name is, is owned by them uh, in one bigger house that we just don't know of, right? LVMH or uh, think of any beer companies probably owned by either Anheuser-Busch or uh, uh, was it Miller Coors? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. In uh, Denver, Colorado, I think is where they're, uh, yep, where they're, where they're based. <laughs> yeah. I remember seeing the, the plant, uh, and I think it was in Golden, Colorado. I think I used to hike, hike I think right. buy it. Um, so let me ask you about your book. Okay. Now, you. when you wrote the decision-making employee, clearly you're thinking Bitcoin, clearly you're thinking decentralized finance. Mm -hmm. What in the world do those have to do with a employee who can actually make his own, his or her, own autonomous decisions. Um, yeah. Usually when you work for a company, you have to fight yes. in, uh, in order to really be a part of a group or to have input made. I mean, this famous story, Bill Gates starting his own business because nobody would listen to him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's the same, I think was true for uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah. I you know, I that those are those are very good examples to use and i think any entrepreneur will relate to that is hey i don't want a boss anymore i'm just gonna go do this myself right we get more from collaboration i mean that goes yes. without saying so how do you take you know what we would all like the decision making employee mm -hmm. how do you argue not only for it which i think to mm -hmm. me to me personally is a given <laughs> But how do you argue that it can be done? How yeah. do you how do you take the manager and say, hey, Out man, the equation. Mm -hmm. or make the manager a benevolent dictator, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term? Yeah. So, Again, with with anything I say here, there's going to be that spectrum of, you know, you have the benevolent dictator, the, the loved boss uh, you have over here, the no boss you have and then in the middle, like a pseudo boss or whatever. Right. So there is this spectrum. And. It all, it, you know, I don't say uh, that it's going to relate specifically to blockchain or decentralized finance. Of course, those two things could probably amplify this and do in something called a, a DAO, which is a, a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, but but that out of the fold, because that's the extreme. 
you have these companies based in the same principles, um, you know, if we're looking at Friedrich Hayek with his internal pricing structure f models and, and how he talks about specific knowledge, the, the use of knowledge, and that's really what it is. So there's general knowledge and specific knowledge. And he states that if you are somehow able to capture all of the specific knowledge in a company, it will be the most efficient. What does that mean? Mm. So okay. specific knowledge, right? It's specific to each individual. You are a salesperson and to close the deal, you need to, let's just pick a ridiculous, uh, you need to know the middle name of the client. Well, then why the heck is uh, our CEO making the decision to close this deal? There's no way they know that middle name. There's probably no way they even know the first name unless they read it in the report, right? So when it comes down to who should make the decision on that million dollar deal, should probably be the person who's been working with that person, the salesperson, the entire time. So, you know, does it always have to be that person? No. If you can somehow feasibly and reliably relay that information back to the decision maker, that's all you need. The easiest way to go about this, though, is to give decision making power or privilege to the people in the decisions uh, where that matters most, right? So it's not about, hey, oh, chaos, uh, you know, anarchy, no more boss. It's being a decision making uh, employee because it matters and it will mm. uh, help the company get to a better spot, you know. But there are examples, you know, I would say that, well, uh, let's just pick example. I, I want to, uh, name some companies that, you know, work in that structure. Uh, so Johnson & Johnson would be one. Sure, they're a huge company. But there's a, a line from their, um, well, now XX president, because uh, I believe their current one just stepped down, uh, is that they don't let the Japanese, or the, the New York office influence the what's going on in Japan. They let the Japanese office make all the decisions for the Japan operations because I guarantee you very little people in New York are going to speak Japanese, know the culture, uh, anything that has to do with what's going on in Japan. But the Japan office understands that and the New York office wouldn't expect the Japanese office to make uh, any decisions for the, the New York office either, right? So they do it at a very high level. Mm, okay. Yeah, there are companies then like, you know, Zappos is, is a good example, uh, but that's kind of a different model as well called Holacracy. Um, Twitter to an, to an extent as well, but the, you know, and you, you have it in any startup as well, where employees make decisions. Cause guess what? It's so fast moving. We can't always sit down and talk about everything. So, Hey, you go out, you're the head of strategy and, and also the head of whatever, cause you wear a lot of hats, just make all the decisions and give me the basis. Uh, so I stay in the loop as the founder. Right. And you see this coming, you see this happening more and more. And I think it has to uh, just logically, these companies are growing bigger and bigger and the spans of control are, are growing. So every manager has more people working under them now. They have to be delegating, right? Or delegating mm. decision-making or they'd be going crazy. So um, I, I think that's the what the decision-making employee is is more so about, though what what the book is about is, is you know, how do you succeed in a in a position where you're being told, hey, here are the reins go run there's our north star just follow that and any you know run any direction take whatever maze you want um we don't care but as long as you get there or, or near it that's fine that's a lot of pressure that's a lot of stress for it's a lot of used pressure and a lot of stress it's also a lot of um figuring it out as you go along because you oh, don't yeah. you don't have the structure in a way it's like freelancing mm -hmm. where the client doesn't know what they want or conversely where the um, client gives you the reins and says, I trust you based on your articulated experience. Now go do what you think is best. Obviously you have one extreme or the other. One is heaven, one is hell. Mm -hmm. um, what's the middle ground? Yeah, uh, so the middle ground there is, you know, well, so I, I think that is the middle ground. I think there are companies that go even further, but if we want to go in, yeah, let's zoom in on that. So you have an employee, like we just stated, being told decision-making power, make your decisions. You have on the other end, cubicle, do make this Excel sheet and don't leave till five, right? In the middle, I think you have what most of us are experiencing right now, 
this uh, pandemic has transformed how we do work and a lot of us work from home, right? Or work remotely. Um, that's, that's pretty easy to point at middle ground because it's, I close my computer, guess what? Boss isn't breathing down my neck. I can go eat lunch when I want, work out when I want, as long as I get my work done. So I think that is the middle ground where it's, I have a, you know, some autonomy and that gives me a little more, um, joy in, in in where i work and that's why you see people everyone wanting to not everyone but a lot of people wanting to go online and wanting to stay online i think most studies have reflected that that the majority of people would prefer to work remotely if that would be permitted you know um and it still amazes me how there are so many businesses insisting that employees come to the physical location when you know that the more people you cram into these tiny little physical mm -hmm. cubicles, the more people invariably are going to get COVID and spread it. Sure. And now it's, it's... how do you insure them? At what point are the insurance companies going to crack down and say, look, we need to raise your 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 rates we need to raise everything because you're getting more and more people very very ill half the people get vaccinated half of them refuse to do it or whatever and all these other variables that is that is going to work driving okay probably traffic then sitting all day and then getting up driving back those are two right. hours wasted where you're not getting good meals good exercise you're already at risk probably just from your diet and and exercise life uh, style because you can't do those things you don't have the opportunity to so of course you're going to be at more at a higher risk as well of, of getting ill from from any ailment. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I mean I I probably lost thirty pounds just not working in a cubicle. I mean it's just because <laughs> you're, you're you're not like you said you change mm -hmm. your diet so you don't have to mm -hmm. only eat what can be refrigerated and so on and everything. Okay, tell me who the book is for ideally. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, it is definitely for people, I, I, you know, and I wrote this before this pandemic. Uh, I had no idea that we'd all be working online, uh, that we'd all be having, uh, being given greater decision-making power and, and having more flexibility in our schedules. But I guess this is for everyone now. It used to just be for people who really want to, really want to change or not happy with their current work life of being told, Hey, you're doing this uh, wrong. You're doing this right. And, and one of breath of fresh air uh, working at a company where they have, as Dan Pink refers to it, uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose where they can have probably two or three of those things um, and live a better life, enjoy what they do. And um, this is how they do it. Um, and so that that's, I guess, yeah, it's for everyone now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and at no point was it not for someone but it was for a more specific group at one point. Uh, now I do think it's it's for a larger group. Okay. You know, I, I, I've got so many questions, but I'm trying to stay on track here. <laughs> Let me ask you just as an aside, because I'd mm -hmm. love to get your take on this. A long time ago when I took Aikido, I loved it. Now, mm -hmm. you have the main instructor, the Shihan, and so each time you go and you take a class, you have the main instructor, but in almost all cases, the instructor would have four, I don't want to say sub instructors, but assistants who would be usually in back of the class. And so the main teacher would come up and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. I'm going to set the tone. Basically, here's what's going to be done. Here's why we're doing it. This is very serious. Be careful and so on. Then the practice would begin. These people sitting in back, the assistants, for lack of a better term, would come in and then basically do the instructor's job, even though the instructor is sitting somewhere else or smoking a joint or whatever the instructor is doing, right? We don't, you know, sometimes the instructor would even be there or the instructor would come back at the end of the class. So is that similar in some way to what you're advocating for in terms of how management would do its work? Is that even 
That's uh, no, sure. Yeah, that that's definitely in the same vein. Um, Cause I, that's go ahead. I was just going to say there was, there is an agency that I worked at one of the, the mm -hmm. last agencies that I worked at where you knew who was in charge, you knew who the top dogs were and everything, yeah, of course. but we had different groups. So you had the project manager, that's the person in charge of this team. And then in the team, there were different people fulfilling different roles. So you would have yeah. different teams. Is that somewhat decentralized? Is that somewhat yeah. decentralized management? There's um, a company, um, and, and the book is mostly me talking to people and what I call learning out loud. Um, you know, because what, what do I know? Uh, I, I want to take what others have experienced and put it all in one place so that I can learn it and learn it out loud for others. Um, there's an example uh, of a company called Arc Touch, and they're based in California, um, in San Francisco. And they are run by a, um, a CEO named Eric Shapiro. And so what Eric does is he ha he's CEO, but he has his managers, he's his manager ring and they are like the, uh, the instructors, um, helpers, right. As we, as you just alluded to. And so the goal is any project that comes in, they're an app development company, uh, for high-end apps, Disney, HP. And so for any project that comes in, say HP wants a new app, there's a team delegated to that. And one manager goes to that team with the, with, they have a, uh, discussion with Eric and Eric says, I want this, this, and this, these are the criteria. This is, uh, you know, how it should probably work, but Hey, run with it a little. That manager becomes the mini CEO of that team and can operate to the full extent of whatever Eric takes a step back. Unless the whatever some margin hits a 74% satisfactory margin or whatever of the client. And then he steps in. So I think it's very similar. It's yeah, the the teacher takes a step or the instructor takes a step back. The the padwans, whatever, go about and teach the the even littler padwans. And um if they need help, you know, teacher's always there. He's back in the back room doing whatever on a smoking a joint on a Joe Rogan podcast or or whatever he's doing. And uh, it, yeah, hey, can you come out and show me that again? Oh yeah, sure, here, boom. So I think you're right. I think that, and that definitely, Eric Shapiro's company, it, Arc Touch is a decentralized model. Is it fully decentralized? No, right? But is it a decentralized top-down approach? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a, a very similar aspect of what you're saying. The knowledge is transferred, but it's not always the teacher or the instructor that's telling everyone what to do directly so you have a little more leeway with decision making for those uh um, the helpers okay so where do you see the future of blockchain mm -hmm. of bitcoin of okay. decentralized finance where do you see them headed if we were to get in that car from you know marty mcfly sure and and, and go into the future 50 years where do you see these things being not, I, you know, as realistically as possible? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and it, it's obviously there's a battle that occurs with the U.S. government and governments that don't want this to take away different revenue models or, or what, power, essentially. Right. So there's always that fight. And let's just say that it goes pretty smoothly and. Um, you know, not that they give it right up because that's still a component of the future, but I do see, I do see a lot of companies and not all, not all companies should be decentralized by the way, but I do see a lot of companies shifting to this model because there's more in it for the individual, not just some CEO getting paid a million dollars. It's how about everyone gets paid a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. That sounds good to everyone. Right. Um, and I, I think that is the predominant model that comes about. So uh, DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations are certainly a route, but then there's also the LLCs, the corporations that mm. exercise more decentralized practices. Mm. They use technology, blockchain technology to implement that as well. So whether that's uh, internal feedback of, of information that needs to be relayed in certain ways, boom, that's definitely one. Uh, if it's internal models. So if you look at Sears, uh, which went bankrupt in 2018, uh, yeah, they created a, a poor incentive structure between the 30 
um, you know, Kmart, Sears, blah, 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 all the other um, subsidiaries. So you create better feedback uh, pricing structures or whatever internally to incentivize, better incentive structures, period. Uh, Cause you can do a whole lot more. You can code mm. a whole lot more. If you're into the book Freakonomics, like you'll love this stuff. Um, Cause incentives with blockchain are, yeah, our next level. Um, so, so there's that, but more fundamentally uh, what it does for us. Uh, let's look back at supply chain. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty neat example of how it changes our lives um, where I'll be able to scan a pop tart box or, or a Hershey bar and scan the Hershey bar and see exactly where every ingredient in that Hershey bar came from. Well, is it organic? Is it uh, ethically sourced? Uh, there was a point where the, I believe it was the Hershey CEO said uh, to the question, is your cocoa ethically sourced? Uh, does it use child labor? I think they said, well, we'd have no way of knowing. And it's like, oh my gosh, come on guys. Like, <laughs> this But you is, do this have is, a way of knowing. I'm sure they do. Oh, sure. But guess what? Now we would. We could scan right. it, see on the map where, oh, wait a second, boycott Hershey. Mm. You know what I mean? So the the social uh, level there is uh, huge. The decentralized social medias, that's another thing uh, where you have social medias that, are, well, we can all say that Facebook, all these, uh, sorry, just call it Facebook, but you know, I, the, the, the big one is um, they're not ethically run, right? Right. They're, social they're, media in general. In general is not right. that good. So if you have decentralized social medias that, hey, I it's built not by one person that's saying this is the model, this is what we need to do. It's everyone coming together and saying, hey, how do how would I want to be treated in the system, right? And you can create incentive structures within to for like if I like someone's thing, guess what? They actually uh, I don't know, get some kind of. Uh, there's just so much there. I don't even want to get into that. That oh, but yeah. So sorry. That's probably a long tangent. I can go on for a while with with different ideations, but it does change your life dramatically on the social level, on the work level, on the finance level, uh, a lot, and uh, even transportation and you name it, it changes it. Yeah, it sounds like the future basically that that you envision mm -hmm. is kind of like a, a maybe a, a William Gibson type mm -hmm. uh philip k dick type of um future in which you well, well, know, we all David, tap think, into this yeah yeah you know think what, of, think about know. the internet what did right. the internet do right think about the internet 20 years ago versus where we're at now this call amazing right even right. though the microphones we're using like it's just it, it accelerates everything uh it's the next silicon revolution uh right yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, it, it, absolutely. I mean, the 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we probably had the technology to do what we're doing now. But the quality sure. would have been would be expensive. <laughs> it would be more expensive. It would be a little <laughs> bit more clunky. I yes. don't think 15 years ago, we had the capability to send files directly <laughs> while I'm talking to you like they could do no. with, with the zoom or what have you. Um, so well my favorite one is the it's the photo from i think it's 1974 or something uh, it might even be it's probably earlier than that but it's the five megabyte drive that's like the size of a car being loaded on an airplane it's like five megabytes what <laughs> you know it, yeah it, it, i i used to say that you know when i was in college i used to check my email with the sega saturn netlink and if you remember that i mean with dial up with dial up. Dial up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's what we had at that location in Virginia. Yeah. So how long did it take you to check your email? Two hours. <laughs> oh man. Two hours. If you're lucky. So you put <laughs> something in the oven, you go take a shower. Maybe it'll be up there on the screen if you're lucky. Now you, you know, we expect it to be instantaneous and we have an uh, instant gratification culture, which is a whole other topic altogether. So let me, in closing, uh, first of all, thank you for your time, Devin, but also- oh, no, thank you. Do you, let's all briefly touch on your own business or the business that you're involved with and uh, where others uh, listening or watching can purchase your book. Yeah. So the book is uh, easy. It's um, just, I mean, Amazon, 100% um, of the proceeds go to the ACLU Nationwide Foundation. And um, I actually have another book coming out uh, in early December 
it's through the Leica Academy and um, with Brilliant Graphics uh, printing it. It's a fine arts photography monograph is what they like to call it. Um, but it's just a photography book that's using um, a different medium to discuss decentralization. There's academic writing in there as well, but uh, the main focus is the photos. Um, I have a very great mentor there, Mark DePaula, um, who has mentored me along the way. Uh, he's fantastic. Uh, his stuff's in the MoMA, he's shot for Vogue, you should check him out. And um, yeah, so both of those will be available uh, there. I, I assume the second one will. I'm, I'm not yet decided on the method. Um, but oh yeah, the company, um, uh, it, I'm very passionate about what we're doing because the whole point, and so it's called Wise Token is the token that we've created on the blockchain. And it is a, a it's not, so there's, blo there's Bitcoin, which is its own blockchain. Then there's the Ethereum blockchain. Now people will refer to the coin as Ethereum as well. We usually refer to it as Ether or ETH, um, and that's the coin that's used on the Ethereum blockchain. There's the Cardano blockchain, VeChain blockchain, uh, Teza, like there's tons of these blockchains that have different rules, right? They're the, the basis for the internet. The code, like what code do you use? What rules are there? So the one we chose, actually we're on a few and for a reason I'll get to maybe, um, but we're on the Ethereum blockchain first and foremost, because that's where... 90% of blockchain based businesses uh, operate. It's the, it was not the first Bitcoin was the first, but Ethereum was the, it was the upgrade and people will be mad if, at me for saying that, but uh, I, I believe that. And a lot of people believe that. And so you can do more with it. It's programmable money. At the very so, least it's gained more traction more uh, rapidly. Yeah. Yes. Since 2014 uh, yeah. to now versus 2008 to now or nine to now. Yeah. Um, and Ethereum is number two to Bitcoin. Um, I believe it's half the market cap. But anyway, so the company is called Wise Token. What Wise is trying to do at a fundamental level, um, or at a, at a macro level, I guess, it is lower the barrier of financial access to everyone in the world without a fee structure and without a profit structure. So we are offering traditional financial tools, not in the same wording for, for obviously some regulatory reasons, but the same access to time lock, you know, uh, earning uh, similar, not like, or, or, you know, a copy of, but similar to bonds, if you want to put a, an image in your head. And then another tool that's similar to loans uh, or, you know, putting your money in a savings account, which is then lent to people who borrow out uh, money from the bank, right? We're offering these resources to everyone in the world with no activation cost and with no profit structure. So it's a not for profit. I don't take home a, a cut of the fees because I'm one of the 10 people on the team, right? It's entirely decentralized, 100%. I could not, no one on the team, not even our top de lead developer could change anything about it, right? It is locked. The $500 million uh, we have total uh, in, in locked is like, it's locked. It is only removable by the people who put the money in, right? So you have this financial system where even if you're the last person, it's not going to zero because it's also asset backed where we didn't just create these tokens out of thin air. And that's the criticism I think often of Bitcoin is it just came out of thin air. What does it represent? What's the value? There's no intrinsic value. No, there is a good argument there yeah. with Ethereum uh, or ETH, I should say, built on the Ethereum blockchain. People using the Ethereum blockchain, which is, again, 90% of blockchain businesses, it's a huge industry already and a trillion dollars. Um, and every time a transaction or an interaction of any kind of smart contract or just code of any kind, you need to pay a small amount of Ether to get the transaction going. It's just how the system works. And that Ether goes to, well, it used to go to the people supporting the network. Now part of it goes to actually just disappearing forever to create a deflationary effect of the token. But that is still needed, right? So we backed our token by a pool of 50,000 of these Ether locked away, immutable, untouchable, except by the people who own Wise Token on this side, and they can remove it for their ETH at any time. So go ahead. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to ask you, how long has Wise Coin been in existence? Yeah. 
Yeah. So why? Yeah. Wise token. Wise token. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and actually, let me. This is um um uh, not an important distinction. It's one of those linguistic things that everyone gets mad at you for. Um, the coin is if it's the coin of the blockchain, so Ether coin, Bitcoin, uh, Tezos coin. If it's built on top of the blockchain and not inherently, you know, needed, it's a token. Uh, and that's just the only distinction. So if you want to, you know, correct your smart Bitcoin friend when they make a mistake once, like, there you go. Um, that'll be fun. <laughs> but yeah, Wise Token has been around, started, launched. Uh, we had a 50-day fair pre-sale, so a fair launch. Our team didn't get any tokens, which is not the standard. It is, there's a pre-sale, it's hidden for some VIPs, only invite. Uh, and the team gets 50% of the cut or eight, well, standard 60 uh, for, for marketing and for whatever. And we promise we'll get the value uh, back to you somehow, right? In the utility we're offering. We said, well, one, that's not decentralized. If we have a majority control of the tokens, we can just crash the price, right? That's not fair. So a fair launch enables true decentralization from the start and just, uh, you know, it doesn't put a any kind of target on our back for dipping our hands in the money or, or whatever. So, you know, it's, it, it's just fair. It's ethical. It's, it's creates a community that everyone's equal, even the team and sure we're building on it, but guess what? There are also two other companies that have come in to build on the infrastructure we've laid down. Cause essentially what we are is we're a scaling solution for a financial scaling solution for Ethereum. We're upgrading the financial capabilities of Ethereum to make it more accessible to all to create tools on top of it that can you know earn um interest over time or take out a loan even if you're like even if you're a felon or or an accused felon uh or yeah and you've done maybe you've done your time you can't take out a loan in the united states well guess what we don't care who you are there's no identity it's just a wallet address and if you have the appropriate collateral and you want to take out a hundred bucks guess what? You can do that. And also it's not a taxable event as well. So you, you know, you get into this game that only billionaires have been, you know, multimillionaires have been able to play in, which is not pay taxes. Cause, and I'm not saying not to pay your taxes, but I'm just saying it's, it's not a taxable event. It's a law, right? It's you borrow against your money is not something that you have to report to the IRS. Right. So it's, it's opening a new world to these um, you know, th these rules, these financial rules that have been held back from everyone except the people at the top. Well, guess what? Now we all have access to it. Are they going to change it? Probably not, right? I don't think Bezos, I think Bezos' uh, lobbying team is strong enough to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. But uh, I guess we can all just enjoy it now. So yes, that's another reason why the United States government's probably not a big fan of this um, because it's <laughs> allowing more and more people to not evade taxes, but use a, a loophole in the system that was built for the people at the top to keep their money. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, it's definitely a new world. And remember it's, you know, th these companies have zero, uh, our company, zero dollar overhead, right? Besides, you know, paying our employees who literally our, our founder pays out of pocket. He's just happened to be in the right uh, financial situation and have the right ideas and wanted to make this happen with no investors that we had to pay back or whatever. So it can be a truly not for profit endeavor where all the profits generated from any of the financial systems are just given back to the token holders on a weekly basis. And not in our token, but like in ETH or in Binance coin, whatever blockchain we're on. It's definitely interesting <laughs> to see how it evolves. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, if anybody watching or listening wants to get in touch with you, perhaps interview you for their own podcast or of course. anything else, or maybe ask you for some information, how can they best reach you? Yeah. Um, so I'm most active on like Discord or Telegram um, for for work. That's where most of our community of like, uh, you know, 10,000 some people sit and ask questions all day. So I'm definitely there. Uh, but info at Devin Marty, D E V I N M A R T Y dot com is, is a great way to reach me as well. Okay. Listen, Devin, thank you so much for your time and for your energy. I really, really appreciate it. David, thank you very much. Uh, you ask great questions, and I love how, uh, you know, just inquisitive and also. Um, I just love, uh, I think you get it, and I love when people get it uh, because it's. It's the next wave of the future, in my opinion. So it's the revolution that is occurring, this decentralized revolution. And um, 
I'm glad you see the the ethical humanity uh, of of it, uh, the purpose we get out of it, and um, just the the health effects of um, how this is better for us as an individual. And uh, it's always good to talk to someone who um, who's on my team when it comes to that, and who's on I guess everyone's team when it comes to that. So Absolutely. thank you, David. Absolutely, you're more than welcome. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.